Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our midweek service here at New Testament Baptist Church in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. My name is Pastor Ken Parrott, and uh, we are uh, on our midweek service. We've been going through what we call the life of Christ, which is looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels, going through right from the beginning, uh, right through the end, where Christ again um, ascends up and uh, commissions his disciples. So uh, we are, we spent time last week in Luke 18 passage. Um, we, we did that. Uh, we basically looked at the rich young ruler. We looked at verse 18, chapter 18, verse 18, right down through to verse 23. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is look over the other passages in Matthew 19 and Mark 10. I'd like to cover those tonight. And uh, so if you would, um, let's pray. I'll, actually, I'll read, I'll read the Matthew 19 passage here. And then what we'll do is uh, we will pray here. So uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Let me just turn there myself. Matthew 19, 16. Matthew 19, 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, and go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, again, bless your word, bless our time tonight. Speak to hearts, meet with needs, Lord God. We pray especially for those who aren't saved. God, you would just open their eyes and to the gospel tonight, Lord God. Lord God, we look to you tonight. Uh, Father, we ask that you would also speak to the hearts and lives of those who are saved, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, uh, to be careful, Lord God, as your word says, Lord God, that, Lord God, the, the love of money, not money, but the love of money, Lord God, and riches can be very enticing, Lord God, and Father, to to cause one to stray away from you. So, Father, help us tonight. Help us. God, may we use what you've blessed us with for your, to further your kingdom, uh, to bring honor and glory to your name. And God will just thank you and praise you, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, this, uh, let's look at this passage here, the Matthew 19 passage. And then, like I said, we'll kind of go over the Mark 10. We'll see how the time goes here. And behold, one came and said on them, Good master, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? <clears throat> and he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Notice he didn't say keep the commandment. He said keep the commandments, plural. There's more than one, of course. As a matter of fact, if you remember from our study last week, Jesus basically uh, focused on the six of the Ten Commandments, actually five specifically he mentioned, and then the last commandment he reserved and saved for the latter part of the discussion with the rich young ruler. And really, that was the one that he zeroed in on because here this young man is saying, you know what, I've done these, I've, I've kept the commandments, um, you know, when he gets down to the end there, uh, he says, I've done these. I've kept these from my youth. But yet, Jesus had not mentioned the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And we found out last week that that was his problem. And uh, so, anyway, so Jesus says, keep the commandments. And he saith unto him, which? So when you look at this passage, You'll notice that in, when we get to the Mark passage, we already uh, looked at Luke 18 passage, that word which does not appear. In other words, which ones, Lord? Which ones? <laughs> Amen? Um, 
And he said unto them, which? Jesus said, then Jesus gives a list and omits the 10th commandment. Amen? And it's interesting, um, in verse 18, Jesus, the first thing he says, thou shalt do no murder. That's an interesting statement there because when you study, you know, there are people out there that feel that, um, you know, they're, uh, how can I say, conscientious objector to for conscription in the military and so forth. And they claim, maybe some may claim as, as a, from a Christian perspective that the Bible says thou shalt not kill. And, uh, well, we got a few problems with that. Uh, when you study the scriptures, we even see in Romans chapter 13 that the government has a right to bear the sword. Well, we know what the sword was used for, amen, for capital punishment, which, of course, in our government, we do not have anymore, but used to be in our government. Um, the Bible speaks for capital punishment. There were certain crimes that were capital crimes. We won't get into all those. That's for another message in itself. So what Jesus referred to when you do the study to, dis, to, to discern the difference between what he meant by thou shalt not kill versus thou shalt do no murder, what Jesus was saying there was this, premeditated murder, premeditated murder is a capital crime. There are times in battles, we see that all through the Old Testament, people died. The Lord told, told them to go and, and to, to war against different nations. And so, again, the Bible's very clear. So, so that's, again, that's a whole message in itself, but Jesus divine, defined, thou shalt not kill. Amen. And, you know, by the way, while, this, while people get concerned over that, are you concerned about the abortion rate in Canada? Are you concerned about the abortion rate in America? Amen. We got a big problem. Well, I don't believe that's killing in the womb. Yes, it is. Amen. Life begins at conception, according to the Bible. Even some Christians don't believe that. How about that? That's, that shows you where we're at spiritually in our world tonight, in Christianity. And again, as I've said, I think it was on Sunday, here we are, you know, um, you know, the world maybe is here, and it's, this is movement away from God. They're moving away from the Bible. Let's say the Bible is representative of here. Well, as much as, you know, the world keeps on shifting, if you looked at where where the world was, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago, Christians have moved to that position, to where the world was. We're moving along with the world. When we should stay the course, the standard is the Word of God. It's the plumb line. It hasn't changed. The world's changing all the time, endorsing sin, unrighteousness, evil. What should we do? Stand firm on the Word of God. Amen. So anyway... So in that Matthew 19 passage, he says there, um, so he, which, the question, which, which one, you know? Then Jesus mentions, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young men said unto them, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I? <laughs> well, you ask the question, you're going to get the answer from Jesus. How about that? Amen? You got a question for Jesus? He's got the answer. By the way, the Bible, this book here that I have in my hand is the answer book. I don't know what your question is tonight, but the answers are found in the Bible. We have the answers. The question is, do we know where the answers are as believers to help unbelievers or even other believers grow in their faith? Amen? So we have the answer. So the young men asked the question, what lack I? What, what am I lacking here? Amen? And he says, what lack I? He says, I've observed. I've kept these things since I was a kid. Yeah, but there's one that you got a problem with, young man. What is it? Stuff. What is it? Material things. What is it? Covetous. It's what it is. You know, it, it's like, you know, you, you would think that if you're, you are 
uh, affluent, you have much riches, and those things increase in your life that, you know, can you keep your heart right with God? That's the great test tonight. The Bible tells us that in another passage in Matthew chapter 6, keep your place there in Matthew 19, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus here, in the Sermon on the Mount here, he says in verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. You're not supposed to lay up stuff down here. You're supposed to lay up stuff up there, treasures. By the way, they're different kind of treasures, amen? They're things that, as the Bible says here in verse 19, where moth and rust doth corrupt. Treasures down here, moth and rust corrupts, and where thieves break through and steal. A thief can steal it, therefore it's not thief-proofed, it's not rust-proof, and it's not moth-proofed if your treasures are here. Because all of those three things will get them. Amen? There's a passage over in 1 Timothy 6 that says where you need food and raiment, raiment, clothing. The moth will get them someday. Amen? The thief will get your material possessions. You know, we live in a world, I mean, we have security at the church and homes, many homes have security. Why? Why do we got to lock doors? Why do we got to lock things up? Why? Because we got a problem in our world. People steal. You don't lock it up. And even if you lock it up, they'll try to break in and steal it. Amen. Jesus said, lay up, verse 20, yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So there's no thieves up in heaven. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, there's no moths in heaven. Amen, and there's not going to be any rust in heaven. How about that? Things are going to last forever. What we have in heaven, what we inherit in heaven as believers, because we put our faith and trust in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ on Calvary, the moth can't get it, can't get it, the rust won't get it, and there's no thieves up there to steal it from us. Thank God for that, amen? Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there there will your heart be also. There's a direct correlation between how you handle and deal with money and how you treasure it, what kind of affection you have for it, okay? There's a direct correlation between all of that stuff and your heart. I've said sometimes to folks, I says, you know what? You can find out where a person's heart is by just looking at their Bank statement. See where they're spending their money. Amen? Hey, you know what? Have you remembered God? Have you remembered God? You know what? People don't. People get forgetful. People just live their lives. Amen? Where's your heart tonight? Where's your heart? Anyway, so he tells them there, he says, you know what? So what do you lack? What do you lack? <laughs> he says, what do I lack? You ask, again, you're going to ask Jesus that question? You better be ready for the answer. Amen? What do I lack? Uh, where do I start? <laughs> How about that? Where do I start? Amen? How about this one? Let's, let's think about this one. Commandment number 10, son. Mr. Rich, young ruler. How about commandment number 10? Let's work on that one. You remember that one, young man? Jesus said on verse 21 of Matthew 9, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And then he put the icing on the cake, come and follow me. After you sell everything, you give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. And he says, now come and follow me. You say, boy, that's a tall order. Well, Jesus knew that this young man had a problem with stuff. That was his, his life was wrapped around things and money. He was rich. It wasn't wrong to be rich. What the problem was, he had a heart that was covetous. 
As a matter of fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, covetousness, which is idolatry. We've got a lot of idolaters in North America. We've got a lot of idolaters in Canada. Covetous, i got to have more stuff, more stuff. I want to buy this, I want to buy that. We fill up our houses with stuff and we put it out for trash years later. How about that? Amen. We live in an idolatrous society because it's all about stuff. Jesus said that life is not consists of the things which a man possess. That's the way the world operates. Is, yeah, look at that person. Look what they got. When you look at the richest people. They look at how much they've amassed in their wealth. Look at that. Look at that life. God, Jesus said, that's not life. <laughs> that's not life. <laughs> Man. It doesn't consist in the things that a person possesses. That's the way the world operates. God operates different than that. What's life? Amen. What is real life? What is the abundant life? If you're saved, you have Bibles. Jesus, I want you to have life and life more abundantly. Are you, are you living that life tonight if you're saved? You ought to be. Or your heart has been taken away with the stuff. The, the things that you possess, possess you maybe tonight. I hope not. I hope not. I hope that's not the case tonight. I hope they don't possess your heart. Amen. Well, the stuff possessed this young man's heart. He wouldn't let go of it. Isn't that something? All this stuff kept him from coming to Christ, kept him from following Jesus Christ. Verse 22 says, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here is the only place where it says he was a young man. It's found in the Matthew account. He's a young man. He leaves sorrowfully. He walks away with tears because he loves this stuff and he won't serve God. He won't live for God. He won't come to Christ. He has great possessions. Those possessions possess him instead of him possessing them. That's idolatry, amen? You know what? You say, well, you know, I, I could do certain things here and follow Christ, but if you say to Jesus, you, you just go to him in prayer and say, God, what do I lack? Ask God that question. What do I lack in my life? Can you help me? Can you show me some things, God, that I need to work on in my life? You better get ready. God will show you what you need to do. Are you willing to do them? That's the next question. Would you be willing to let God show you that? Amen. I hope so. I hope so. Well, we'll stop there on that Matthew passage. Let's go to the Mark passage now. And again, some differences as we look through these three places in the Gospels that talk about the rich young ruler. So this first, this Mark 10, 10 passage, just go over there now, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. In verse 17, we'll go from verse 17 and we're going to go down to about verse 22. Okay, and then, like I said, next week, Lord willing, we'll, we'll, we'll continue the discourse after the account of the rich young ruler. Jesus gets into a discussion about riches, and we'll talk some more about that, Lord willing, next Wednesday night. So in the Mark 10 passage, verse 17, and the Bible says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. Well, that's interesting. I've got to stop there because if you're with us last week in Luke 18, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say he came running. Um, he didn't say that one was kneeling. This young man was kneeling. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in Matthew. It doesn't say that in Luke. Someone said, well, there's a contradiction. In the no, there isn't. You just got to look at these four Gospels, as I've said so many times to 
to, the, to our people that Matthew presents Christ as king. Mark presents Christ as servant. Luke presents Christ as the son of, uh, son of man. And John presents Christ as the Son of God, and God the Son. So there's different perspectives, each of the gospel accounts, and they complement each other. They do not contradict each other. They complement each other. And you've got to keep that understanding in mind when you look at this. So these are complementary. So this complements the other two passages. He's running. He's kneeling. Wow. Then he asks him, he's asking him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto them, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. We'll see, that is an extra accent here in Mark, Mark's account. He loved him, he loved him, he showed compassion. And said unto him, one thing, <laughs> one thing. <laughs> You're just lacking one thing. You know, the question was, what am I lacking? Well, as we saw in the Matthew account, what am I lacking? One thing, one thing. That's something, one thing would keep someone from following God, serving God. What is the one thing that will keep you? It's not a whole bunch of things sometimes. Some things it may be. But sometimes it's one thing that we can't, grip, can't get a grip on in our life that keeps us from being what we ought to be for God. How about that? And by the way, when I say can't, it's not because God has not given us the power and the victory through him in Christ. It's that our rotten old flesh, we allow it to take control. And we lack that one thing. One thing keeps us. It's a one thing. Keeps us from being what we ought to be. There's one thing in our life that keeps us from, from growing in grace, from being where we should be. As we look back a year past, and a couple of years, and five, and 10, and 15, and 20, and how many years you've been saved, how are you doing spiritually? Are you still getting hung down by that besetting sin that Romans 12 or Hebrews 12 talks about that we talked about on Sunday? A besetting sin, the sin that which doth so easily beset us. There's one thing you can't, you're not dealing with. You think it's just going to go away? It's not going to go away. There's one thing Jesus says you lack. What is the one thing you lack in your life? If Jesus, if you were, instead of the rich young ruler, was you in his place, and you said, hey, Jesus, like, he, like the young men said, um, what lack I? That was, those were his words at the end of verse 20 of Matthew 19, the other passage. What lack I? What do I lack? Where do I come short? short? Where do I fall short? You want to know that answer? You're going to get it, like I've already said. You're going to get the answer. Are you open to listen? Are you open to do something about it? Or are you just going to carry on like, okay, well, Jesus told me. The Lord tells me in the Bible. I know what I should be doing, but I just, are you doing it? That's the greatest thing. You're here, but are you a doer? You ought to be a doer. We got too many hearers and not enough doers. I'm good. I'm glad for hearing, but what good is the hearing if you ain't doing? We got people out there that, man, they got so much truth at their fingertips on the internet. And they got Bibles galore and Bible messages and preaching and teaching all over happening. What are you doing with it? 
So Jesus said one thing you lack here. You lack one thing here. You lack one thing. So he said there in that Mark passage, let's get back to there, Mark chapter 10. He says, one thing, verse 21, one thing thou lackest, <laughs> go thy way, sell what that whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. You wouldn't believe how sadness could come right in when someone asked you, someone's would say something like Christ said this is what you need to do you really love God you really want to serve him hmm the Lord knows our weakness he does he knows our weakness and he'll zero in on that weakness amen we all have a weakness we all have a weakness he went away he went away sad. He went away grieved, the Bible says, for he had great possessions. He knew the commandments. Jesus said that. He says, you know the commandments in verse 19 of Mark 10. You know them. You know? You know the commandments. You know what's right tonight. You're saved tonight? You know what's right. You know what? There's a lot of things that I, I've met Christians over the years. You know, they want to learn about some really deep truths and all that. And it's not wrong in itself. But yet, on a more practical level, their relationships with people are terrible. Their marriages are not good. The relationship with the kids are not good, and the kids with the parents not good. So we want to learn all these deep truths, but we can't even have proper relationships with each other. And unfortunately, we want to accumulate knowledge, but yet we don't have that time with God alone with Him on a daily basis. Oh, but we want to know some deep truth of the Bible. What good is that if you're... If the world... Listen, the world doesn't want to know how much you know. They want to know. They want to see that in action. They want to see how that, that, that works out in your life. What is it doing to you? Is it affecting your life? Do you really, does it, you know, are you, are you, what are you doing with it? As I've just mentioned a few moments ago. It says, you know the commandments. He knew them. And that verse 20 says, Master, I have observed the, all these have I observed from my youth. Yeah, the ones he might have listed. So, he claims to have not never committed adultery, but yet Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, he equated that with, idol with adultery. You know, we got a lot of that going on in our world tonight, even amongst Christians. Pornography running rampant on the Internet, and we got all that stuff in a little de package device, tablets, computers. Well, we're connected, all right, but what are you connected to? What if someone asked to see your history on your phone? Would you let them see it? What if we put the history of your phone, tablet, computer on a big screen in the church? Would you want everybody to see where you've been? Hmm. Maybe you need to take care of some business with God because God sees it and he knows it all. He knows your history. You can erase it all you want, but God sees that history. He knows the history. But here we are, we think we're fooling our spouse or fooling our kids or fooling our parents, you kids, what you're doing. 
Yeah, we don't see things the way we should see them, and we don't take them as serious as we should if we're honest with ourselves. It says, I've observed these from my youth. Thank God for young people that are raised in a Christian home. I talked a little bit about that on the Sunday morning message about despising discipline. You know, God wants to discipline us, chastise us, correct us. Aren't you glad for that? You're saved. You're a Christian tonight. Aren't you glad that God wants to correct you? When you go in the wrong path, amen, he's going to try to put some flags up for you. He's going to try to hinder and show you, wait a minute, what are you doing? He'll use people. He'll, he'll use whatever he has to. What a great God. What a great God. Are you taking the warning from God? As a matter of fact, over in Revelation, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Some, uh, listen, the world, some of them are against this matter of corporal punishment and discipline. And, but we found even Christians have gone down that path. Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. For someone to say, I love my kids too much that I won't chasten them, they don't love them. They can't not love because God's love Christ's love, his love rebukes and chastens. How about that? You really love, you'll rebuke and chasten. You know, from your youth, from your youth, amen? I believe our young, our young generation is going to be really, really heavily accountable to God because we have so much truth available to us, printed Bibles, access to good Bible preaching and teaching, as well as trash on the Internet. It's a matter of the heart and your choices you make. If you can't control it, you need to, do, you need to make some changes. You, there's things you can do to prevent certain things from coming up or for you to access or your kids to access. And if that doesn't work, maybe you just shouldn't have these things. You should cut yourself off from them. Be better that than to save your home, family, and your marriage. From my youth, he said. I followed this from my youth. But something you didn't, something happened here. You got rich, you got successful as a young man, and it ruined you. Doesn't ruin everybody. Jesus never said the Bible doesn't teach that money is evil. He says in 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is the root of all evil. But money ruined this young man. Material things, he was rich. It ruined him. It's a hard one to deal with. Success worldly success can you stay true to god and be in your success it's pretty tough it's pretty tough it really is pretty tough that was his problem then jesus said there in that 20, uh, 21st passage come take up your cross and follow me that's discipleship see these passages talk about riches and discipleship and then we'll go back to talking about riches again after this discussion, which we'll look at, Lord willing, next week. He got sad. He went away grieved. Lord gives you instruction. The Bible tells us in John's epistles that his commandments aren't grievous. These commandments grieved him. You know what? Obeying God should not be a grievous. Shouldn't be a grief. It ought to be a joy. You ought to love, want to live, obey God and serve God. It ought to cause sadness and grief when the Lord says, here's what you need to do. You said, what do I lack? And God gives you the answer and you don't like the answer. How does that work? I'm sad because the Lord told me the truth. 
We live in a world where even Christians don't want to, let's give, speak the truth in love. As we see in verse 21, and Jesus beholding him, loved him. He spoke the truth in love. And still that didn't get the right response. You can't point the finger at Jesus and say, well, Jesus really didn't love him, you know. He was pretty hard on him. And the Bible says he loved him. He showed compassion. And that still was not enough. You know, we ought to show love to people. Hey, parents, are you showing love to your kids? As I've just said a few moments ago over in that Revelation 3 passage, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I think it's just around Revelation 3.20, 3.19, I think it is. Jesus loved him. He showed his love to him. And one of the ways he showed his love to him, he gave him some instruction, and the young man didn't like the instruction. That's the world we're living in. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. Young people struggle in receiving the instruction. They struggle in that. And parents, I hope you're giving the instruction in a loving manner. I hope you don't wait till things build up and problems build up and you explode in anger and lose your temper. That's not going to help. You need to deal with things regularly in a timely manner, even as the Old Testament says, but times. <laughs> regular, often enough, regular, just constantly. You say, it's wearing me down. Tell me about it. Every parent goes through that, that is trying to train up a child in the way he should go. Train up, to bring up. Not bring down, amen, train up. He went away grieved. Jesus beholding him loved him. He says, one thing you're lacking, boy. One thing you lack. And what's that? <laughs> you're covetous. Basically, in so many words, Jesus said, you are covetous. So in those three passages, again, the Matthew 19, let's just look at this one last time and we're going to wrap up for tonight. So in the Matthew 19 passage, he says, he came, one came unto him. Mark 10 says, and when he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. That's that unique bit of information. Then Luke 18 starts off with, in verse 18, and a certain ruler asked him. So we know, as we've read through all of this, he's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. That's how we get that, putting all three accounts together. The question is, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Mark says, the count Mark in verse 17, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so does Luke 18. Then verse 17 of Matthew 19, and he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none that good, but good, good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. The other passages say, Thou knowest the commandments. But in the Matthew passage, he says, Jesus says, Keep the commandments. Not commandment, but commandments. In the Matthew passage, the young man says, which? Which one? <laughs> In other words, he knows there's some of them he's not, illicit, he's not obeying. Which? Which one should I obey? Oh, all of them. <laughs> They're commandments. They all should be obeyed. Not just some of them. That's how we are. Well, that's, oh, it's okay if I don't do that or this or that, but I should do this because we say they're really bad, bad things if we don't, you know, that's, they're serious commandments. They're serious. What the rest aren't? They're all important. Why would God give us commandments if they're not all important? You need to obey them all. 
So he says, which one? And when you go down through the list on all three accounts, pretty much the same. He defines murder as we already read in the Matthew 19 passage. He goes through five of the six commandments that relate to man's relationship with each other. But he omits the last one, thou shalt not covet. Because he's going to get to that in a different way, in a different worded manner, in dealing with this young man's heart. And that's where we find the young man and says, responds in verse 20 of the Matthew passage, also verse 20 in the Mark 10 passage, how about that? And in the Luke 18 passage, verse 21, he says, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I? He says pretty much the same in the other Mark and Luke passage. I've observed from my youth or I've kept from my youth. But in the Matthew passage is the only place where he says, what lack I? What do I lack? What am I missing here, Jesus? <laughs> like I said, don't ask the question. If you be ready for an answer, if you ask the Lord, you'll get it. And he gives them the instruction. And it's pretty much the same across the board from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Except for this. He finishes up, come follow me in Matthew and Luke, but he adds a little different dimension in the Mark 10 passage in, at the end of verse 21. Come, take up the cross and follow me. We all have a cross to bear. As we read in other accounts in the Gospels, the Lord says at times, deny yourself. That would be dealing with the covetousness in this young man's life. Deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. You got to deny self. You got to say no to your, yourself, no to me. That's probably one of the hardest persons. Oh, it's easy to say no to your spouse or no to your parents or no to your kids, but how about no to yourself? How about that one? Just try that one out. Answer yourself and say no. And after he heard that, we see in all three accounts, we find out in the Matthew, he is a young man. But in all three accounts, we see he had great possessions or he was very rich. He went away grieved and sorrowful. It grieved him. It grieved him. Listen, tonight, I, I don't know. What do you lack? Have you, have you examined your heart? Have you done self-examination? I hope so. Bible says to do that. Amen? We'll just look at one last passage. Go to Psalm 139. We'll read that, and then we're done tonight. And next week, Lord, when we'll carry on from where these three accounts left off with the account of the rich young ruler, and we'll carry on talking. Christ continues on talking about riches. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. How about this? Let's, let's, let's allow God to do this for us tonight, okay? In verses 23 and 24, God gives preachers like myself a little bit of a point by point. He says, search me. It's the first thing. God, search me. Oh, God, know my heart. Search me. Now he says, try me, test me. Test me, God. Would you let God test you? Would you let God search your heart? I hope so. And know my thoughts. He knows them all right. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your heart. When you read Isaiah 14, where Lucifer fell, the Bible says he said it in his heart, the five I wills. In his heart, God knows 
the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. This book reveals that, Hebrews 4.12. He knows our heart tonight. He knows your heart tonight. But what we, this verse is teaching is, I want God to do this, to search me, try me, verse 24, and see if there be any wicked way in me. So search me, try me, number three, convict me. Would you let God convict you tonight? Or are you going to use all the excuses that we talked about last Sunday morning where Adam and Eve, everybody's pointing the blame. It's not, it's not my fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my husband's fault. It's my wife's fault. My kid's fault. The devil's fault. We live in a world where nobody wants to take ownership and responsibility for any of their actions. We want to play the blame game. That's 6,000 years old. Blaming everybody, but taking full response. Listen, there are things, yes, that may be out of your control and out of your hands, but there's a lot that's within your control and within your hands that you need to act. You need to take responsibility for and deal with it. Would you let God convict you tonight? What is it that you lack tonight? What are you missing? Would you ask the Lord that? Say, Lord, what do I lack in my life? Would you point it out to me? Would you open my eyes to that? If you're serious about that, God will show you. And then my next question to you is, what are you going to do about it when he does show you? You're going to work on it? Amen? How much preaching and teaching can you go through and not act upon some things? How many messages? How many times can you open the Bible and the Holy Spirit works on your heart and you don't do anything about it? How many times have you sung a song and there's a, a phrase or a word or a sentence in that song that the Holy Spirit has taken and worked in your heart and you still don't want to deal with it? It's like Sunday morning's message, despising discipline. Yet you have not returned unto me. That's what the Lord said through Amos to the nation of Israel. You haven't returned. God did this. Try to get their attention. God did this. God did this. And you said, it's not me. It's not me. It's you. Then he says, in the last part of verse 24, and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me. Try me. Convict me. Lead me. Well, listen, I'll leave you with that tonight. And Lord willing, we'll connect with you on Sunday and next Wednesday night. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you again for your word. Now bless. God, just meet with needs and hearts and lives. Thank you again for your goodness. Thank you again for another opportunity to, to open the word, to preach it, to teach it, to be a help to people, Lord God. There's a great need, Lord God. People need the truth. They need the truth. And I need to speak that truth, preach it, Teach it with love. So God, help us. You, Lord, you, you've exposed something tonight in the lives of the people that will listen to this message. God, help them to see that. Help them to act upon it. Help not to walk away and just ignore it, that it's going to go away. Help them realize they got to work on that. Take care of that. Get help. They, maybe they need another brother and sister in Christ, or maybe they need a... Um, a pastor or someone to help them out. Now, God bless, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.